G'day folks. Well, it's a bit late tonight, but I'm starting to make progress in the cleanup. Nice and tidy now. Got some engines and things down there. I think the flywheel engine's still here. And just for the hell of it, I decided to play with the Datsun again. Brad suggested playing with the uh, valve lash, or valve clearance. So I'm doing that at the moment. Yeah, it's pretty much been teaching me how to set up car engines, how the uh, valve lash on these things work, particularly tonight. It just told me that they wear in, not out. They don't become sloppy and noisy, they become very tight. As the valve margin wears out, like the valve seat, valve wears into the head, these tappets lose clearance. Like, even though this one here is 180 degrees off firing point, it doesn't even move. Like, it's that tight that it's just worn its way up that it's sitting on the cam already. So, really, I want point, point 0.385 millimeters gap between this tappet and that camshaft in the position that it's in. But realistically, there is no gap. So, that's why this engine runs like shit. It's just way too tight. None of these move. That one's got a tiny bit of movement in it, but they probably haven't been done in about 10 years. So, let's do the valve lash on this engine and fire it up. Okay, now these old dats and heads are pretty much the same as the old 1960s, 70s era Mercedes-Benz single overhead cam uh, engine heads. And this thing's just a four-cylinder version of the six-cylinder that I pulled off an old uh, Mercedes with Brad, V8 Jagner. Uh, the rocker system is the same, cam system is the same, it's just a Japanese-built clone of a Mercedes-Benz head. It's probably why this engine's so damn reliable. The Datsun 1800 is a very solid, reliable engine and the valve adjustment is pretty much the same. We have to slacken off that nut there and then wind the uh, post down so that this rocker has a bit of clearance. I've already played with this one so it's a little bit loose but let's look at some gauges. These are just the Repco brand gauges, El Cheapos, I think they're about $15. They don't have one which is quite right for this job. I want a .35. Okay, camera's back online again just sort of freaks out. Uh, these are the Repco gauges. Closest one to what I want is 0.381. It's slightly larger than what Brad recommended, but it wouldn't hurt. Good, about, good thing about these is they're offset. If you've got a, uh, like a Ford or a BMW head, the cam's often recessed right down in the guts of it, and you can't get to them with normal parallel gauges like these. These are American made Cortland gauges and you don't really want to be bending them and trying to jam them into a tight spot they're a good quality gauge my Starrett gauges are on loan to a friend and they're even better than these these ones are old though they're Cortland number 230 American stuff these are just cheapo Chinese gauges they've got a few certain sizes but the good thing is they're all offset or angled Okay, got my 0.35 Cortland gauge out. Let's try and adjust this thing without messing anything up. One screw down, we get more clearance. Still too tight. I've already wound this thing about half, three quarters of a turn. Make sure that cam lobe's pointing towards the sky before you do this and make sure the engine's cold. If it's hot, it'll be a bit tighter. It's a little bit tight. There's two bolts here. You want a 17mm for the bottom nut. And I'm using a really old spanner, which is a quarter inch Whitworth. But I think 13 mil will do. Of course, this span is probably three times or four times older than I am. It's a real antique. <laughs> but I still use it. 
Yeah. Just a little bit of resistance is all you want. Like that's perfect right there. It's gonna be definitely a lot better than it was. So hold that nut tight. And then we'll hold the bolt tight, the stud, and then tighten the nut underneath it. Nice and tight. Hopefully without changing the clearance. No, it's perfect. So that one's done. I've got seven more to do. I suppose barring the engine over is probably the hardest part of this exercise. It's not exactly easy to get to the crankshaft nut and put a socket on it. I suppose you could try and drive it through the cam chain, or well, the cam retainer nut, but if you loosen that thing off then you could end up in a world of trouble. The camshaft won't go anywhere, you've just got to make sure you put it back on tight. Uh, easiest thing to do. You don't have to take the dizzy cap off like I have, but just take the coil lead off, put it somewhere where it can arc out, and just tap the key until you get it in the right position. In this case it's easy because I've got a uh, remote controller. And no battery power. Okay, I've got battery power now. That's better. I don't know where that coil's shortened out, but then again, I've got the ignition turned off. So that's just another one of my little hot wire things. In a car, just make sure it's somewhere it can arc out to ground. Now the cylinder I want is actually at the right position. Just make sure the cam lobe is pointing skyward. But, yeah, you just tap the key. Try and get it in the right position. There we go. The first valve on number two which is intake it's, uh, in sorry intake exhaust intake exhaust exhaust intake intake exhaust there we go all right a bit too late to test fire it but I'm just going to crank it over a few times with no ignition and we'll see how it sounds It sounds much more consistent. I'll bet you that number one has much more compression too. That was really tight. When I did the initial compression test, I wrote it on the block. They're 90 and 120 for all the other three. And I'll bet you that's a lot better now. I'm going to get oil everywhere because the oil pump works well, but... At least I know it's working properly. I'll test fire this tomorrow. Get the old pre-emission carburetor on it with a nice big sight glass on it. Uh, original coil. Yeah, it should work quite well. Your tank is sitting there. That eccentric lobe there is the fuel pump, fuel pump drive. That paddle is connected to a diaphragm in the bottom of the fuel pump there, it just pushes up and down on it. Definitely got to get a decent thing for it, fuel tank. Battery is what came with the Range Rover. It's dead when I got it. I had it on charge for 48 hours, so I'd say it's a reasonably rejuvenated battery. Hell, it was only a couple of months old before they killed it. So hopefully it's still got a couple of years left in it. And the oil's come through nice. It's a heavyweight oil. It's an old engine, so I put some pretty heavy stuff in it. But that'll do for now, and stay tuned for a test run. I'm just running down the side of the block. Slightly slanted four-cylinder. That's the way they designed them, though.